Nice to work in, the, in this group from uh, uh, Luke Stein. Oh, Luke Stein. Yeah, yeah. Almighty. Yeah. Mm. So she's yeah. also from there. Uh, so actually, he works also a bit on also like uh, uh, solar cell photo. Mm. I mean, our is more basic and stuff. So like we put molecules on uh, titanium oxide and mm -hmm. see what, uh, what, what what happens if you can. I mean, our sort of goal would be also be to see if you can really uh, do with single molecules and you see like a charge separation. Um, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, on a single molecule level. Yeah, single molecule level. Yeah. And we also did some of this, uh, what we call this band engineering stuff, you can observe it by Kelvin. So that does work quite well. But more on uh, this gets and such things. I mean, that's something we do. Yeah. Grecia itself stuff actually it's almost completely changed for perovskites nowadays. You know, even Grecia himself has yeah, yeah, yeah. they almost it, completely uh, avoided the uh, uh, yeah. traditional dice. Uh, and his successor uh, uh, Andre Andres uh, uh, yeah. from, from yeah. Sweden, yeah? Yeah, Andres, exactly, Andres. Yeah. Hagenfeld, Hagenfeld. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. 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 I mean he is one of the perovskite guys, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, that's, that's cool. <laughs> I don't know, I, I so far never, uh, I mean, we thought about it, but it's always... So, welcome back. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. Uh, you know, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed lunch, the poster session and the coffee break. And now we are back with our lectures, uh, with the final lecture actually, uh, which will be delivered by Professor Ernst Meyer. Ernst Meyer, Dr. Ernst Meyer is a full professor at the University of Basel in the <coughs> Department of Physics. He received his PhD in 1992 from the University of Basel and performed postdoctoral studies at the IBM Research Center Zurich. His main research interests are in the field of scanning probe microscopy with applications to nanomechanics and nanoelectronics. Professor Meyer has published extensively, including articles in journals such as Science, Nature Materials, and Nature Communications. Uh, and I'm personally very familiar with his research because I also studied friction, nanofriction, during my PhD years. Uh, please join me welcoming Professor Meyer on stage. So. Thank you very much for the warm welcome and thank you very much uh, for the invitation and I really enjoy this event here. I think it's very nice and I think I, I, we also have a, a nanoscience center in, at our university and maybe we should also start a nano day. <laughs> I think it's a good idea. I mean, I think it has a, a lot of dynamics going on and that's nice. So yeah, anyhow, I, I, I will talk here. Uh, I mean, the title is, sounds a bit maybe special, but I also decided to change a little bit uh, towards more general topic of uh, nanotribology uh, because I had the impression it's maybe a bit too specialized only to talk about the single molecule experiment. So I will start with the introduction to atomic friction and this event uh, or this, this uh, phenomenon of superlubricity and then I'll, I'll pass on to one of the main experiments. This is uh, uh, the graphene nanoribbons experiments we've done uh, some, some time ago and uh, if time permits I will uh, also talk about some Van der Waals force measurement between <coughs> single atoms so that's sort of one of the possibilities you have if you really can manipulate single atoms and so on. And then, uh, as again, if, if, if I'm in time, I would also talk about uh, a recent nanocar race we were, had the privilege to take part. So it's with molecules, yeah. we will see. Anyhow, so friction, of course, you all know. It's uh, something that in daily, daily life uh, you occur. If you want to move a furniture around, it takes a lot of force. And we all know that cars spend a lot of their energy or waste a lot of energy because of friction in the motor. I mean, some of the fr friction you also need, you know, that uh, if you walk on ice, you, you recognize it's, it's not so good because there's a lack of friction. 
So anyhow, this, uh, you have the impression it's, uh, it's something important, but still from a physics point of view there, there are still a lot of things unknown. I mean, uh, most of the things we learn go back to the Middle Ages or Renaissance from Da Vinci and so on. So I will not talk about that. I think you know that from school. And, but these are very empirical laws. And uh, so one of the ideas of what you call nowadays nanotribology is to simplify the situation a little bit in that sense that uh, we go from a very complex uh, interface as we have it on usual uh, contacts to a, a bit simpler contact of a nanoscale contact, yeah, so uh, a nanometer sized contact. And uh, uh, the main tool I, I, I'm using or we are using uh, at our place is the AFM, so, and it's also, I mean, just a very brief introduction because I think, I guess most of you know that, it's just a, a very sharp tip and you use something like this laser here to, uh, you measure the reflection here from the backside of the cantilever and then you have here a photosensitive detector and then you can determine the position very accurately and by that you get information about the normal and also lateral forces. So this especially this torsion of the cantilever is something which gives you information about, about this friction. And this setup here is also constructed in our department, so we have some of this high precision Swiss um, mechanics uh, in our workshop, so we are quite happy about that and uh, works very well. And uh, yeah, I mean, this is the setup. I will not go in very much details, but yeah, essentially see here comes the fiber and there is some optics which guides the light in vacuum because you cannot use your fingers in vacuum and so on, you know. And uh, so that's the sort of uh, instrumental part. And uh, yeah, I mean, what can you see? I will, as I said, uh, concentrate more now on the friction. So this is what one calls atomic uh, friction or atomic stick slip. So the curve, I mean, if you take a picture, it looks like a normal picture. You see sort of atomic uh, features on the atomic scale. This is a potassium bromide or ionic crystal, something like table salt. And here, if you take a profile, you see a bit more detail. So here you see the, the main effect. So if you move from right to left, you see it, the force increases here. So it, we call that the sticking part, the tip in a way or the contact doesn't move and then it slips and then uh, again it sticks and it increases the force and it slips again and so on. And that repeats with the atomic periodicity and if you remove, uh, move backward you see you get the hysteresis and it sort of repeats here. Also the enclosed area is directly what you call the frictional energy which is dissipated. So you can basically just determine here the area and then you know what, it, what you dissipated here. So and if you calculate in this case, it's something like an electron volt, uh, 1.4 per slip. So that's about, you see, comparable to uh, chemical bonds and uh, it's also about what you really dissipate in this kind of atomic friction. So that's uh, one of the basic mechanisms. So it's probably the, really one of the most important mechanisms to which really dissipate. Of course, in real contact, you also have that what you call wear, so the things uh, they are rubbed away. If you change your tire, you know that a lot of material was rubbed away. So that's something which is not taken into account, but uh, it was already quite early recognized that this mechanism here is really the most important really for friction losses. And so uh, actually the, the model goes back to the 30s. Uh, so in last century, uh, and uh, uh, it, it, it's called Brundle Tomlinson. So Brundle is uh, German, and Tomlinson was an English engineer, and they were thinking about this: this where does the energy go? I mean, uh, Tomlinson was an engineer, and he was thinking if if you calculate all this energy you you dissipate, how much where would occur on a rail of a railway and and then he Im immediately saw that uh, you would have to exchange the rail after or the wheel after a short time so uh, a few days or something and so that means there must be another dissipation mechanism and that's why they introduced already at that time 
atomic scale mechanism, so something like what we just discussed. So and that's the, what we call now brundle tomlinson model. So it's essentially nothing else than a periodic potential, which is uh, superimposed with a, with a uh, parabolic uh, potential. And so if you uh, pull on the contact, you can here jump over this barrier here, this barrier which is of the order of some fraction of electron volts. And, uh, and that's basically the main mechanism. So every time you have one of this instability, you dissipate this energy which, which was stored in the contact. And uh, the same model actually uh, also predicts uh, that you have, if you decrease the, the let's say, these uh, this barriers here, these energy barriers, or if you decrease the, the load, you would even uh, expect something like smooth sliding. So smooth sliding would mean there would be no more friction. But that was, of course, microscopically not, never really observed. And uh, uh, so this Tomlinson model, so I will not show many equations, but that I will quickly show. I mean, this is would be now the model with the potential landscape, periodic, and the spring. And basically, uh, out of that, you can uh, determine a parameter here, uh, which, which describes uh, this relationship between the size of the corrugation here, so let's say the energy uh, of the corrugation, and then also the elastic energy uh, which is in the contact. And if that parameter is of the order of one, you have the transition between these two regimes. So they, they really differ quite drastically here. Uh, if you calculate it, so in one case, if the parameter is smaller than one, you can expect something which is continuous, so go back and forward nothing would happen, so no dissipation. So basically, we call that now there's also superlubricity. And this thing we just discussed before, that would be the stick-slip behavior. So it took actually quite some time until we could really observe that experimentally. And here is now uh, one of these cases. So it's more or less the same experiment as discussed before, AFM with a small contact. If you have a larger load, you see exactly what I described. So you have hysteresis here. And then if you decrease, you see you get basically this uh, uh, more or less uh, continuous sliding, so smooth sliding without real instabilities. And if you plot the force, uh, you see here there is a little, little region here where the, the force is or the friction is sort of zero. So and uh, theoretically, really, you also expect that it's zero. So we, we, we say in this regime, if the parameter here is eta is around one or below one, then uh, you have zero friction. And above, uh, it increases linearly. So in the reality, it means the forces have to be below one nanonewton. That's relatively a measurable force for AFM. It's not a big deal. But for macroscopic uh, uh, cases, it doesn't happen so often. I mean, it's something very difficult to realize. But uh, yeah, I mean, in, in that uh, circumstance, we also thought about, is it really also possible to switch friction uh, as you are used to switch the light on and off? Uh, is it also possible to switch the friction on and off? And it was quite uh, interesting that it really works. I mean, you can apply here a voltage and you see here the friction practically disappears, and then you turn it on electrically, and then you can switch it on. So that uh, was a little trick we, we used, and we, we actuated the contact really with the AC voltage of some volts, and if you hit uh, uh, so a, re a contact resonance frequency, it's possible that the friction really goes down here. So you see you have here at 20 kilohertz, 40 kilohertz. Uh, these are corresponding to the resonance frequency and also half of the resonance frequency. You can decrease and it's really not only a decrease, but if you zoom in here, you see it's really zero. So it seems to be really possible to, to, to enter the regime which has uh, no more measurable friction. I mean, the the mechanism is not so easy to understand, but, but it basically means this oscillation varies this potential landscape. 
So you see it, uh, now the landscape goes up and down, so as we've seen it before with the bundle Thomson model, so now the barrier is big, if it gets smaller and, and, the, and basically the contact still is on the left side, and now maybe the next oscillation you will see it moves but to the next position, but the main point is now it moves nearly in a smooth way, I mean now it happened, huh? there was a little spike as you saw, so uh, uh, as far as we can tell it's not really this super lubricity, it has a finite friction left, so like a viscous term, but it's really very small, so in that sense you can avoid this instability, so you can basically this, by, by this oscillation of the landscape you can move in a, in a more or less smooth way over the surface without instability and by that uh, you reduce atomic friction. So now the question is can you do that on a macroscopic scale, I mean that would be of course interesting, I mean to have really a, a macroscopic object moving in this relatively uh, special way, so we have here an estimate, uh, so it, if you want to uh, have a weight of one gram under these conditions it uh, would mean it corresponds about to 10 millinewtons, so you would have to distribute it to 10 to the 7 mini, mini tips. 10 to the 7 sounds like a lot, so 10 millions, but if you uh, have an array here like 3000 times 3000, then it's not that much. I mean microfabrication, if you have a good clean room or something like this, I think it's feasible. And they are now really work, group working on that, uh, 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 try to really realize it. I mean there was a first uh, activity at IBM uh, some years ago, they uh, constructed 1000 AFMs in one array and they were operating them in a very controlled way, they even used them to make here little holes and there was a plan to make a, a storage media out of that, so a bit like a CD but with mechanical imprints, it didn't turn out because uh, the flash memory are extremely uh, successful nowadays <laughs> as we all know, we can buy uh, I don't know 10, 20 gigabytes nowadays in a little uh, memory stick. Anyhow this shows you can get this arrays and so I think uh, it might be uh, in the future that uh, there will be also some real realization of uh, more or less already macroscopic uh, contacts. But there is also other possibility and there is uh, uh, also a lot of activity in that respect. It's a bit a different concept than what I told you. It's not based on this very small contact but actually on extended contact and it, this is called <coughs> structural lubricity. It's also quite uh, uh, older concept uh, uh, but uh, also more on a theory side, never been uh, for a long time not been realized in the experiment but the idea is very simple so you, you can start with one atom here so if you add a second one which is sort of coupled by a spring or something you will see that it sort of has to move a bit away from the surface and if you have more of them so like extended contact here, so you will see that at a certain point you get into conditions which are really uh, close to what we call uh, 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 super lubricant uh, and so it, it's of course important that the, the distance between these atoms here on the upper side are not the same like on the lower side, so if, the, if you have a commensurable contact it will interlock <coughs> and you will have large friction which increases with the size of the contact, but if you have this incommensurate case uh, it's basically uh, nearly uh, independent of size and also uh, it, it will be very small from the, from the, from the friction values. So this has been observed uh, already in 2004, they did a, it's a group here from Joost Franken and uh, Martin Dienwiebel so they uh, used also sort of an AFM, but at the end of the AFM, it's not visible here, they used a little graphene or graphite flake, so they, which was then approached to uh, graphite, and then they basically turned it in different direction, and, uh, and, and if you basically find the, uh, an angle 
where, where it fits together, so the commensurate case, you have friction, uh, quite large friction, also not so large, but still measurable la uh, large, so it increases, so it's at zero degree and then 60 degree, which corresponds basically to the symmetry of, of graphite. And in between you see uh, you have a very strong decrease, so this would be this incommensurate case. So all over here you have basically uh, uh, negligible friction. So this would be a, uh, basically a way also to go to larger contacts if you somehow manage to have a relatively stiff material like graphene. And, uh, and yeah, I mean there are some other requirements I will talk a bit later. So now I come a bit to more recent experiment and uh, you may think it's a bit uh, extreme but uh, it turns out that it's actually quite nice and also quite uh, in a way uh, you le really learn something about the fundaments, fundaments of friction. So we use uh, a low temperature microscope so it's one at 4 Kelvin uh, and we also use uh, a force sensor which is based on a tuning fork so something like you have in your quartz watch. And uh, so the nice thing about this tuning forks, they have a big spring constant. So here you see this is two prongs. One prong is fixed and, uh, and there is a dip, usually tungsten. And uh, okay, and with that you can do very stable experiment because you have no more thermal drift. So everything is quite under control. And uh, so what we did here, this shown here, is like we take a piece of graphene and uh, we pick it up and then you can either pull it vertically and then measure how uh, strong the adhesion is or you can move it laterally and then you can learn something about the friction. And uh, yeah, so this turned out to be quite an interesting case. We also have to mention the substrate here is gold. So First side you would think, well, the metal is quite strong intera interaction, so uh, not, not so clear if it's really uh, so well chosen, uh, but uh, it turns out that it works quite well, as we will see later. I also have wanted to measure, uh, mention this, this is now completely prepared in vacuum, so I know it's, I'm now very far from everybody who makes biological <laughs> applications, but, but uh, we sort of like it because uh, yeah, you, anyhow, you, you deposit the molecule, that's uh, so, so far not so, uh, not so different. Uh, th that's the precursor, and uh, so it has some bromine end group here. Uh, and if you heat that a bit up, then the bromine uh, atoms, they will diffuse away or even evaporate. And then you have basically molecules which, which are very reactive, so a B radical here, and then if, if you anneal the sample, they will diffuse around and form a polymer. So as you have it in, in, a, in, a, in a polymer in solution, but now on the surface. The surface actually helps a bit uh, because it induces the, let's say, the, 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 the activation energy for the reaction. Uh, other than that, you form here this polymer here. Uh, so you see this is all like this androcene, so three of these phenyls in a way. And uh, so it's, this is real polymer, but if you further anneal it, you can dehydrogenate it and uh, then you form a piece of graphene. So this is a, was developed by the group of Fasel at EMPA originally, and it's a very successful uh, way to produce very clean graphene ribbons. So they are really basically clean in, in the way that everything is prepared in vacuum. Okay, so this is how it looks in SDM, and if you use uh, one of the uh, state-of-the-art AFM, you can see now you get really uh, very nice resolution, so you see all, all the details of the, of the ribbon here, the rings here, and so on. And here, this is actually an additional hydrogen at the end here, and uh, other than that, we see there are no defects. It's very, very nice. It's also uh, passivated with hydrogen here around. Uh, and so we, you see this one of these advantages to run it at low temperature is you can attach a CO molecule to the tip. So this is uh, terminated by CO. And by that, you can get this 
very high resolution. So basically the CO is relatively inactive in that way that uh, the, the, the oxygen which points downward can go very close to a surface. So you really go into a repulsive regime where, where you can then map here this high resolution, intramolecular resolution, it's also called, that works with many molecules and can be really used to, to determine the structure. Anyhow, now, now the next thing is, uh, can we do, learn something about this friction? So this is now a shorter wire and uh, so you can manipulate it, you can measure the force, in this case it was like 90 piconewton, so piconewton is already quite small compared to what we saw before, this was like nanonewton uh, in the atomic stick slip. So it's already indication that it's not so much friction here uh, or, or nearly super lubricant and if you use a larger wire here uh, you see also you can move them, the force do not increase, uh, sometimes it's even decreased, so it varies also a bit, depends a bit on the exact position. Uh, or even here for 21 nanometer you also can move them around. And so in principle you can move really quite long wires, uh, so up to 100 nanometer. And uh, this is the exact procedure, how you determine it, but I will not go into much detail here. So if you plot just the forces, you see it it's scatters a bit with the length, but if you plot uh, the force per unit length, then you see it really decreases. So it means uh, uh, basically it's, it's not really depending on the length, but rather there is something uh, like a depending maybe on the edges or something like that, uh, which, which uh, seems to be effective, but other than that, it's not really scaling with the length, so it doesn't matter if it's that size or that size, so it's, it's, it's not, not depending on the length. So that, that's already quite consistent with this, con uh, this concept of structural lubricity. Also, if you compare, like if you take one of the large values of 100 piconewton, and then you can, uh, you can uh, derive so, sort of an effective uh, energy barrier this gives then around 40 milli electron volt and that means at room temperature this thing would already move. So it's really very low uh, barriers and also uh, small forces. Okay, the more than that you can take one of the wires, pick it up with the tip, move a little bit up and then you can move sideways. Uh, so it's really a it's a, uh, a continuous measurement now of, the, of this uh, sort of force uh, doing the manipulation. And do you see here, you see a nice periodic pattern here, so it's not very large here, these are some hertz frequency shift, but it also shows some like a ondulation or like an envelope here of the force, so it, it varies a little bit uh, with the position. And uh, here's some more data, different heights, so you can pull a bit further out. And so you can move this, this, this ribbon back and forward. You see it's very little hysteresis, and you have this typical here uh, envelope here visible. And uh, uh, these are the simulations uh, which uh, were done by uh, Andrea Benassi, uh, Daniele Barceroni at EMPA. And, uh, and they find basically, you see here, this is also this envelope here, if you zoom in you see this kind of typical periodic pattern which has to do with the substrate and uh, so they find that uh, this transition here, this is, uh, one has to say, the, the gold surface is reconstructed, so it, it has little valleys, very smooth uh, mountains in a way, so it is a FCC face center cubic and HCP uh, areas and so this, uh, this is typical for this reconstruction on gold and so if you, trans, uh, if you move across this uh, area here from FCC to HCP there are the, these largest uh, uh, forces and in between you get sometimes very low and you also can identify with sort of positions where where, uh, where you get a bit more resistance or a bit less resistance of this ribbon. So this is a ribbon and it moves on the gold. And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, in a way if you make snapshots of a small 
ribbon you can now see already here that uh, the biggest changes are here at the border and, uh, and there's really relatively small changes in the middle and here in the video you see it even better, it's a bit longer so you see uh, most of the ribbon actually doesn't change a lot during the motion here so it's only here at the end these edges where, where you have the big change, you see this here it goes blue, red, blue, red also here at the beginning, so this periodic uh, uh, boundary condition so it comes in again uh, and, and so you see here, these are the big changes. You can also revert it, you, you've <coughs> just seen it. So this graphene has, as we already heard, has this very high Young's modulus of the order of a terapascal, so it, it's very stiff, so it also can, you can also move it backward. I mean, as you see, that works also quite well. And so in a way you can see this is really a, what, what one would call an incommensurate uh, contact in this direction of minus 101, so this, uh, which is this direction as it's shown here. If you go in a different direction, in the 1 minus 2, 1 direction, it looks actually quite different. So here you see now these this little blobs here, these red ones. So these are now areas where you find some, uh, some, some more resistance, so it's a sort of a moire pattern. So here the two lattices fit a bit better together and there's more resistance and, and you see also that this pattern always changes. So uh, every slip, you, uh, little motion, unit cell motion, you see that it moves back, uh, between left and right. So this would give, give you some additional force. And uh, so uh, to summarize this part, you can see uh, this is really within this framework of commensurability, you can understand that something like that moving in this uh, 1 minus 2, 1 direction gives a bit more resistance than this. All over it uh, are still very small forces, but, but uh, uh, in, in the experiment actually we see that this direction is really the preferred one, even though you have to move <coughs> over this valleys and mountains of the reconstruction. So it's, uh, you can see that experimentally that it's really preferred. Um, yeah, I mean, what, what is now the problem with this structural lubricity? <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, this uh, is shown here, it's like uh, from uh, Hendrik Hölscher, he sort of explained it very well. So if you have a normal contact in, in air or something, very often, of course, you have some contaminants, yeah, and they are mobile, and then the problem is that they basically move in here at position, where, where, you, where they lock and then the uh, friction basically starts to increase and, and this concept of uh, structural lubricity breaks down and, and the easiest way to see it is that uh, they basically, as you see here, it, it increases with the area. So it depends really on the size. If you have a bigger size or smaller size, uh, it, you will have different friction or different dissipation. And uh, so this happens, for example, here this experiment, but now it's quite a recent uh, experiment from the group from uh, Mehmet Baikara here, I mean I really like that experiment, it's really quite a breakthrough I would say uh, and so here uh, uh, he and his colleagues they observed uh, this lubricity also in air so this is really surprising because uh, you would say in air uh, there are for sure enough contaminants but they could show that uh, this dependence here on the area uh, is consistent with, a, with, a, with the structural lubricity and uh, also the forces say they can be, the islands can be as large as 130,000 square nanometers, that's already very big huh? <laughs> and, uh, and, and still the forces are very small. So it means uh, it seems to be uh, possible that the interface here is clean. I think they uh, showed here from Engin Durgun, uh, uh, that uh, it's really the, the probably the idea here is that the, the molecules here, this what we would call dirt, is either some uh, alkanes or water or whatever. I mean, uh, they they not easy. They cannot easily enter this interface, and that's probably the reason why why it stays in the, under this condition. So that's that's really very nice and uh, really great breakthrough because you, you don't need any more this 
expensive vacuum as we, we have done and uh, it may be also interesting for applications. So. And uh, yeah, I mean, there's also a second case uh, from Ali Erdemir where they used graphene uh, mixed together with uh, nano diamond. And uh, also here, this is, uh, uh, they have shown macroscopic superlubricity. It's a bit more empirical way they did it. So they simply uh, uh, calculated the, the friction coefficients or the ratio between the lateral or friction force divided by normal force. And they see that they get really uh, over really many cycles. So this is really a, in reality, I mean, this is just a visualization. In reality, it's a big pin on disk uh, experiment uh, with a diamond-like carbon film on top the graphene and this nano diamond and they can uh, have this low friction coefficient of 0.004 over thousands of cycles. This is really also a big breakthrough and really is promising that you can use this concept also uh, on, a, on, a, on a macroscopic scale. So uh, as it looks like this nanotribology slowly moves into a direction where you can use it even for macro uh, scale, also for the real world, so to say. Okay, I will uh, show, discuss with you a for a short moment something uh, which is a bit closer to my original title, because I said that we pull on molecules so far, I only show you graphene. Uh, this is a second case also on the, of this on-surface chemistry. So we use uh, uh, Again, uh, a monomer, this dipromopurine, this is this guy here, and uh, you deposit it, and then you also form a polymer. This is then a, a pyrene chain, and uh, the pyrene chain, you can do some experiment. And somehow, we were honestly not really thinking too much about it, but it turns out that with this thing, you also can uh, create graphene nanoribbons uh, by, by annealing, so if they come together, they, they can also here make this dehydrogenation and then you form a piece of chiral graphene. Um, you will see it in a, in a second, so it was more like a side product. Uh, so the guys who did the work here, Remy and Philip, uh, uh, so this is the monomer. So you see um, here is the core and here on the side we have this bromine. So there is still, still there and if you anneal it, then you can uh, form these chains here. Now the chains are, if you, it's maybe a bit difficult for you to see it from the back, but I will show in a second a bit more details. Here, in between, there is still bromine. So it, this was not yet high enough that the bromine would uh, leave the surface. If you heat a bit more, then you see that now we have really these polymer chains. So now they are nicely here, very long uh, wires here. Uh, up to hundreds of nanometers. And now here is one of these uh, uh, purine wires here. So it's, uh, it's really as we've shown it in the, in the sketch. Uh, so you have one unit after the other. And below here you see actually in some cases you also can form uh, ribbons. So here's a ribbon which has actually uh, partially uh, armchair and zigzag mixed. So and calls it also chiral, chiral uh, graphene nanoribbon. And if you zoom in at the end, you see that the bromine is really not here anymore. Okay, now this is uh, also one of these friction experiments. And uh, now this guy, or this uh, chain here, it moves in this simple direction. So not, not like the graphene nanoribbon before, which only moved in, in, this, in this direction. So here this is now moving in the 1 minus 2, 1 direction. And, uh, and you see also that you have this oscillation, which corresponds to the spacing here, the small spacing, which is a bit strange because it's like half, half a unit cell. So it only goes from here to here. Then was question, well, what, what, why does it show this periodicity? And so we were uh, thinking about it and it turns out that actually this ribbon, it makes a, a zigzag path. So it, it's not, li not really moving straight, but it, it sort of avoids the maxima here, or the, the atoms here, and so it makes a bit this snail-like motion. Uh, and, uh, uh, and also if you uh, further 
go a bit vertically, you see, then you get a second distance which uh, corresponds to 0.5 nanometers, so that's basically now distance you understand easier, also one nanometer, and so on. So you see all these distances, and you see also multiple slips, also multiple distance uh, motion. So this zigzag motion, that's something quite interesting, so it, it's a bit different from what, what we've seen with uh, graphene, and also this multiple slips, uh, it basically it means you don't jump, jump to the next position here, from here to here, but you also jump one distance further, so it means the damping was here not so strong. So that's a, in a way quite interesting that these polymer chains, they, 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 they have this kind of, uh, I mean I don't have yet the MD calculation, that's still calculating at the moment with the colleagues from, uh, from Spain. Uh, and, uh, but here is a simulation or a model which shows this 2D kind of motion. I think eventually it comes back, I thought. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you see it really makes this kind of snail-like motion. So something uh, also quite uh, funny that uh, we didn't expect. Uh, so that seems to be something which, uh, which comes and it gives a bit uh, a sort of a viscous drag. Okay, so that's, that was sort of about this friction uh, kind of studies and you, see, you saw that uh, we can even maybe use it for the future. And for the last part, I wanted to show you a bit more of this atomic scale control. Uh, that's of course quite fascinating for us and maybe also for you. So the idea here is that we pick up a xenon atom here by the tip and we have a xenon atom here on a molecular network. Uh, it's, a, it's a relatively complicated network, but it turns out it's, it's, it's really uh, uh, necessary, uh, because if you would put it, this is copper, I have to say, uh, uh, and, and this copper somehow, uh, together with this molecular network, it forms this trimers here, and they, they are, and then, the, then the xenon sits in a, in a comfortable position, and then you can do uh, this, this spectroscopy measurement. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit complicated to explain, but anyhow, this wonderful, as you may know from, uh, from your studies, this typical Leonard Jones and this part with R to the 6, that's this wonderful part, and the C6, we will, be, we will see that in a moment, that's something you can measure by this method, so also even on a macro scale, this gecko, for example, has a very co good control of the contact area and can increase the Van der Waals interaction. So this, uh, this Van der Waals interaction that can also uh, create a bit more long-range force if, the, if you have a bigger, bigger uh, contact or, for example, the gap between this layered material or noble gases interaction, noble gases. Okay, so here a bit more details so the, the, the sequence is shown here. So uh, the first thing is to pick up a xenon, so you have this network uh, which is created a bit in a similar way as we discussed before with graphene. So you have the needed at 300 C and then you have this copper trimers here where, where, uh, where the xenon also like to sit. So you deposit a bit of xenon from the gas and then you pick up one, so then it's on the tip. So that's the first stage, so you can tell that from from a little jump in the current and also in the falls. And now uh, you can use again this high resolution AFM to, to, to characterize the, the network, so this would be the SDM information, so you see it's a bit difficult to say what, what is exactly happening. This is now with the xenon tip image, it's not, it's not bad, but still one has to say with the, C, uh, with the CO you get a bit closer, you get a bit more information, you can see really much more of the details, so there you really can identify here this, this guy and also uh, a bit more details. It what turned out for this study that it's important that you shape the tip, that it's really sharp, so that, uh, uh, so you use a focused iron beam, so you, by that you can reduce the long range forces and by that uh, you can really finally get this uh, Atom, atom interaction of the Van der Waals forces. <coughs> okay, now the next step is 
you, you again have Xenon on here. Uh, in principle, you can of course select, you can take it away or put, put them back again. Uh, what is important here is uh, that there are actually two nodes which are not, uh, not identical. So if you make then afterwards the sort of the uh, relative measurement, it, it's important that you sort of uh, memorize if it's the right, this node two or, or node one, because the background will be a bit different, but other than that, it's, it's, it's something you can take in account by, by the following. So you, you, you deposit it, as for example, here it will be a xenon, here will be a krypton, here will be an empty node. Uh, so uh, we also did it with argon. And uh, so you get the curve here and after you deposit it, uh, you, you put it somewhere back and then measure on the, on the same node, you, you measure then the, the interaction on the empty node side and then you get sort of an interaction which is characteristic for the interaction between this single xenon atom or the xenon and krypton or the xenon and argon. Um, you may say it may be nicer if, if you would measure krypton with krypton and argon with argon, but that turned out to be difficult because the, uh, this, this tips, they don't like to keep them stable enough. I mean, so xenon worked and also the xenon on this, uh, on this molecular network is okay and also krypton on the molecular network or argon, but uh, uh, so you have basically just measured xenon with xenon or xenon with krypton, xenon with argon. And these are the three curves and you see that the smallest one has also the smallest uh, maximum interaction here. Uh, so this is frequency shift and then out of that you can calculate the force here and uh, also the potential energy. So you see it's of the order of uh, 30 milli electron volt or 20 milli electron or 10 milli electron volt. And as I said, the smallest has also the smallest interaction, krypton intermediate and xenon largest. Okay, so uh, then we started to, of course, compare it to the theory and uh, made some fits. And uh, you, as I said before, we all know it should depend on uh, power to the six. And yeah, I mean, for, for the argon and for the krypton, the fits are reasonable. But uh, it actually turned out to, for xenon, it's, it's quite big deviation. So actually the fit, the fit was even better for R to minus Five, I mean, so, so that seems to be already a deviation. And then also one had to, of course, adopt this parameter C6. And we also we made some comparison with some calculation from Adam Foster, uh, some DFT calculation. And they, they are actually found, we found quite good agreement with the calculation. Uh, and with the fit, as I said, was not so accurate, but nevertheless you get the C, this value C6 and then also what was quite surprising is that the measured value with AFM are typically larger. So, so they are a factor of two larger compared to gas-gas interaction. So it means somehow this, uh, uh, this xenon or, or argon or, <coughs> or uh, krypton on the surface, they have a bit different polarizability. So they're possibly uh, somehow uh, changed by the interaction with the substrate. So they're not completely like a free atom. And so this gives you actually quite valuable information so that even the Van der Waals forces are somehow changed by the presence of, of the surface. Okay, so um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I don't know, my, still a bit time, I guess. So just to summarize this part, I think uh, the main part was that we, we could see that these graphene nanoribbons really uh, are a nice example of this uh, uh, basically um, stru uh, structural lubricity, what we call them. And we saw so also that if you change the structure from HCP to FCC, that gives rise to some changes. And then the last example was this Van der Waals force. And now for your entertainment, I will talk a little bit about uh, our recent involvement in the nanocar race. You will see it's, it has to do something with friction, but it was also uh, a bit fun. Uh, so it happened uh, uh, during two days. 
so it was also uh, there was also a YouTube live channel or something like that and uh, and uh, then you see uh, here are um, the the molecules which were involved so they were from different teams so this is the USA team USA Austria <laughs> this is the Swiss team so that's our molecule Japanese molecule France you see they had a very complicated molecule with real wheels <laughs> and uh, this is the also this is the US team the, the this was US Austria so actually the experimental group is Austria they had a chemist from 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 US and this is the, the US team here and this is uh, Germany okay they they met there at, uh, in this week or they, they in these days and the idea was that we, that you do really a race with these molecules so here shown again uh, they all had uh, uh, yeah I mean I think they are more or less the same figures as I just pointed out so this is the French the Basel of Swiss uh, so I'm very happy to tell you that this uh, molecule has the world record or one of the highest <laughs> speeds of 20 <laughs> nanometer per hour so, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, this is the Ohio as a as, as so law, and the Glatz team with Leonard Grill and this Kuba Nims team, and this this Dresden. They had actually they call it windmill. So it's actually it's there are th four molecules together, but they form a quite com uh, quite a quite a stable aggregate and can be moved as an entity so they had the uh, I mean the idea was that if they lose one of the molecules they could put it back so like you change your wheel in a car you can <laughs> change the molecule put it back if you lose one of the uh, of the full molecule you had to restart I mean that was like the rule so if it would go somewhere and you don't find it anyway you were not allowed to take another one and go to the same position you, you had to start from beginning but they were allowed that they could take another molecule and fix it huh? okay this is now our molecule for the people in chemistry I put the name I will not pronounce it <laughs> uh, so this is from our department cut in Halskopf synthesized it so you see it's it's not so complicated molecule so it essentially here this phenyl and then the here this nitrogen free nitrogen so they, they give a bit more interaction of course uh, with uh, again a gold substrate uh, and if in the AFM you can actually see it quite well so if it's a high resolution you see these rings here and so on this is a methyl group which sticks out a bit okay this is a racetrack uh, <laughs> you see this is again the herring bone reconstruction so this is uh, this valley I talked about before where we moved with the graphene ribbon now the, 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 the challenge was you take one of these molecules and you should start here then you go back ba uh, in the valley you should go to the first turn and then go around here and then another turn and then this is uh, <coughs> yeah that's where you end up hopefully and uh, uh, yeah and it was of course important that you didn't leave the, tra uh, the track here and uh, also it was the most dangerous places actually were these places here uh, you will see in a second why because these places are really a bit more sticky I mean gold you would say it's not so reactive but actually here it's uh, it's a bit more reactive and uh, and uh, so it happened that in some cases the molecules would stick there and then then you were finished yeah they disqualified so here is now like, uh, uh, one of the sequences so one has to say you're not allowed to push the molecule but you only inject the tunneling current and the tunneling current basically excites some vibration of the molecule and then it moves a little bit and uh, so you're not, you cannot simply push it, that would be too easy of course uh, <coughs> so only by tunneling current without touching and you see they, they, they managed to do it quite well so Remy and Tobias, uh, our, our drivers so to say, <laughs> uh, they practice quite a bit and then you see they can make quite a complicated path and avoid even other molecules and so on. 
And now here's actually a, a little movie where you see how, how well controlled it moves. So actually here it, it moved over uh, one of these. Uh, so yeah, but, but in principle you can also move over one of these uh, herringbone uh, mountains. So it works quite well. And yeah, they, they actually made it, uh, so they were, uh, they won gold on gold, uh, uh, and uh, yeah, uh, it's the first ever international nano car race, and uh, so we're quite proud of that, of course, and as I said, with uh, exciting speed of 20 nanometers per hour. <laughs> okay, this is actually, uh, maybe shows a bit also the science part of it, so this is, uh, you, you pick up the molecule, and which you normally are not allowed to do, I mean, Otherwise, you just take it and put it to the <laughs> where you want, of course. But uh, now you take it and then you move it over the gold surface. You see again the herringbone here. And here in this area, this is really the dangerous place here. Uh, so it, this is very sticky. Uh, so if, if it ends up here, it's practically not possible to, to, to move it anymore by the tunneling current. So that was, that was one of the challenges. So for, for example, for the German team, that was why they failed, so they, they were sticking and they made 20 nanometers and then they, they were stuck. Okay, so that, that was uh, this nanocar race. I don't know if there will be another one, or if maybe somebody of Bill can will participate in the future, who knows. Uh, I wanted to thank, of course, my, my group members here. So Dilek, actually, she's from Turkey. Uh, also working in the group, very happy about that. This is uh, Shigeki, who did a lot of the graphene work. Alexis Bardov uh, is a, a theoretician who still works with us. And Remy, one of the drivers he already saw, and uh, also Tobias. And uh, yeah, and I thank you for your attention. Yes, I mean, there are really a lot of possibilities. So, for example, you can also remove a hydrogen. So, you can dehydrogenate it by the tip. And then, of course, you can start to make uh, different, different uh, interactions. I mean, move things together and form something new. But how complex can you go in this molecular architecture? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, there are examples. I think at at IBM, they they, they even made a, a little calculator with this. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it it made some some calculation. It was this domino effect. So it was like they they put all the molecules in a bit unstable position, and then they could make a little calculation. It took them 20 hours or something, or even more, to to put the the calculation uh, ready, but uh, then then it was it was calculating and, and so but you can do quite complex structure if you have enough time. And but uh, for terms of chemistry and really form different kinds of molecules, there has been not so <coughs> much activity. But but I mean it's just also really I mean it's not that long time that people are able to to do experiment on that scale. I mean, what, what's, what's done, for example, is if you have a, a real mix of very different <coughs> products from chemistry, you can, uh, for example, evaporate or spray it all together, and then you have a wild mix of, of different products. And that you can analyze by, by AFM. That's, that's quite nice. I mean, this is, a, this is done by some groups now. So they, they sometimes analyze very complex, uh, uh, I think one was from asphaltine or something uh, something like that. Huh? Uh, so it had like 100 different molecules 
and then you can really image it more or less in, in, in one run, you know, then you get all this un, uh, more or less a re a reasonable analysis of the structure, yeah. So we yeah, are but to really build up molecular structure, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, maybe in the future, yeah. I know of some cases where where they, uh, I think, functional, I mean, they changed the functionalization of a ribbon and then pulled it up and then measured the different contact resistance, for example. This is, uh, that's sort of a more already practical realization, so the, because the contact always plays a certain role. And, and that, that's something you can control very well, because you, you see what you have and then you can start to modify it and see what is the effect. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, in principle, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have a question. So, uh, how do you attach the carbon monoxide to the tip? How hard is it? How stable is it? It's n it's not that difficult. I mean, you 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 deposit it. I mean, you just dose in CO. I yeah, have to be a bit careful, of course. You have a sensor somewhere that you in the lab there is no CO and so on. But otherwise, you dose it, and then you see it by STM, you, you see it immediately. And then you uh, approach on one of the COs and, and, and until there is a little jump, and then it's on the tip. And if it's at low temperature, it will, be, it will remain on the tip in most cases. They're not all stable. I mean, in some, ca some cases, you have to redo it. But I would say, uh, so to say, it's quite quite a high uh, percentage is working. Yeah, so they're sometimes a little bit too flexible that they, they if you if you move over a structure that they move to the side. But most of them are okay. Up to what temperature does Unfortunately, you have to be at liquid helium. Yeah, already liquid nitrogen is too high. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's that's a bit the disadvantage. So. Uh, I think there are alternatives probably, uh, I mean I heard recently for example the hydrogen also gives reasonable uh, resolution and that even works at, at room temperature. So yeah, I mean th I think that could be, that could be a good, good, good uh, challenge for, also for people in chemistry to think a bit more about if substitute for CO which can be used at room temperature. I, th I would say it should be possible. But and I, I, I just saw a few days ago an example which was very nice and they, they, they say, that it, I mean, of course at room temperature it's sometimes very difficult to say <laughs> because uh, the things move a bit and so on, so it's not that easy to see everything, but they, they say, they have the impression that they, the, the hydrogen, if it terminates, then they also can go closer. I think essentially you need a tip which is not reactive, so it, if the metallic tip of course, if you get too close, you get the uh, interaction or a chemical bond formed. And, and so if you have something which is more inert, so it's in principle hydrogenated is better. Yeah? So if you, if you have a control of that, <coughs> I guess it should be possible. Yeah. I, I was just wondering whether you could do these kind of experiments on, on single crystal metals and see if you can get, for Absolutely, yeah. I mean, there are. <laughs> I mean, there are examples, uh, rutiles, also anastars. Uh, it all all works relatively well. Yeah, I mean, the the preparation of the oxides is more difficult. But it can be done. It can be done, and uh, they have. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yes, absolutely, yeah. I mean, the problem is a little bit that this, this ribbons, we need the uh, metal because of the catalytic activity, but it turns out that uh, you can also grow them. So the group in, in Poland, in, uh, in Krakow, they, ha they, they got also uh, synthesis on, on titanium oxide. So it, it seems to be also possible. And then you, of course, have also the advantage that you're already on an insulate, uh, semiconductor. And so that's also interesting. And as I say, your defects play a role. And 
it's also quite from a practical point of view, these oxides are, are, are often quite good because they, they have defects and if you deposit molecules then they stick on this defect. So even on the room temperature you can you work with single molecules because they are more sticky in a way, you know, okay, they bond to this defect and so on. Yeah. And they are of course m of more practical relevance also probably, yeah. Mm. Okay. And resonant frequencies, friction, drop to near zero. What happens with normal contact force at resonance? Um, yeah, I mean, if you if you resonate the contact, it's it, it's actually uh, it's relatively simple to understand. Uh, it, it means you go up and down. Uh, and so it means the ba if you if you see it more from an energy point of view, the, your barrier will will go up and down. I mean, it will shrink a bit and will increase a bit and shrink a bit. And now the contact is is, is of course uh, that's a bit important that the contact is is is, is relatively fastly reacting. Yeah, so uh, it, it has to follow basically fast enough. Yeah, I mean. So if, if, if for a short time the barrier is, is nearly zero, so it's like say if you, if you have a sinus, you're on the negative side, so the force is decreased, or the barrier is small, and then the, the, the contact can move. And basically it moves without the stick slip, and, uh, and, 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 and so it's a smooth, smooth transition. That's the more, the more or less the point. The negative point, which is also limiting, and which makes the whole method a bit uh, difficult to apply is, because sinus also has a positive sign, so it also means that during the cycle you also will have a short period where the force is increased. And that is something you all know if you drill a hole in a wall and you, you press this hammer function, it also you can drill the hole much better and that happens also here. So if, if, you, if you go too far then you will start to, to make a hole or m m destroy the surface. So it's a bit, you know, you have to, it's a bit delicate, so you need the right balance, not, I mean, you have to reduce it that you, you enter this little window where you have uh, basically uh, zero force, but if you go too far, then you will start to hammer, and then th this is what we also observed sometimes. So that, that's probably also the difficult thing. I mean, you could say, why, why don't people do it with every contact? You could say, I have a contact and I just apply something like white noise and then everything should be excited and then it should move, yeah? But uh, I think one of the reasons is uh, it's very delicate to find the right balance, yeah? That's what I sort of would say, yeah? So, and you have to, the average forces have to be of the order of these nanonewtons to, be, to have a chance, this is uh, sort of the idea, yeah? So, the contact can follow quite fast, so in principle I think in some cases it can go up to hundreds of megahertz, even gigahertz. So they, they are relatively, de depends really on, the, on how fast the contact oscillates or reacts. That's uh, the point, yeah. During the Hmm. Okay, that's the questions I always fear. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, um, I, I, I would say I cannot really answer the questions because, uh, I mean, I know that, that people do really very wonderful work now, this, especially these guys who do this high-speed AFM, they are now on a level where they can start to observe things like that. Uh, I think one of these examples, Ando made this mirror scene which, which, which runs around there. Uh, so yeah, exactly. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, I think in principle, I, I could imagine you can you can uh, you can observe it uh, also in a way as we we did it that you, you get an idea about the, the the barriers which are there. I mean, they're all of course comparable to room temperature. I mean, everything more or less uh, is is in is much more in motion. So. I think the main point is you have to be ve much faster because you have to sort of follow the things because if you're very slow then you will miss everything. So, uh, But I think with the high speed uh, AFMs I think the, the chances are quite good uh, that you can start to see it and I mean I would say for example this experiment uh, as Mehmet has done you can also do it in in, in uh, you know that you, you you press your your object and start to move it. Uh, that's something you can do in liquid. That's no no big problem, I would say. Yeah. I mean, it's first you have to see this. If it's a dynamical process, it's it's. I think it's all about the speed of imaging. That's this is extremely. I mean, viscous force is generally. I mean, I would say uh, are not that. Uh, 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 I mean, that's more, more maybe a bit risky if I say something I don't know too much about. But I would I would guess the viscous drag is not that important because everything is relatively. I mean, it's not a not a really high speed thing you do there. I mean, it's not like in in a machine or something uh, where we have like meter per second or something going on. So I would say uh, the risk is maybe not that important, but for sure entropic forces play a big role. I mean, so the rearrangement of the mo uh, I mean, I think we also heard it in the morning that, uh, that is it plays a role. What is the energetics uh, with the from the water and from the molecule and so on? This is it always plays uh, is an important point. Yeah. So of course, if the if the molecule vents something, the the, the water has or the, the the ionic liquid has to move away, and so in the end, it's a, you have to calculate all these contributions. Yeah, that we I think we heard very nicely in the morning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. Thank you again. Okay. So, thank you very much. <laughs> this also marks the end of the lectures for today. Let's thank again all our in today's lectures <laughs> and uh, we will move move to the ceremony I guess oh, okay so I have to probably uh, off, off my computer okay top secret <laughs> awards <laughs> are received here the USB.
There will be a brief explanation of the whole process now by Professor Serga. Okay, so um, we had a very rigorous um, selection process for nanopicture. We had uh, we sent unique voting links to our professors and um, voting made anonymously, so no one knew the results before uh, we actually collected the uh, numbers with uh, Professor Baikara. And for nanoposter, um, we had committees um, from uh, relevant departments from molecular biology, from chemistry, from physics, they decided which posters to be selected. So there were groups of four or five people and they voted each poster individually. So uh, we have a very transparent and um, good, um, I think, selection process. So first I'd like to start with the nanopicture content finalists. So these are the finalists. They um, sort of matched with our initial criteria, and <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> uh, so we are safe. Uh, our first runner-up is Bartu Shimshek by Nano Snowflake. Uh, okay. Are we going to give the yes. prizes now? Okay. I would like to invite Orhan Güveren Hoca for um, presenting the award. <laughs> Fatal error. Again. <laughs> Okay, so the next runner-up, uh, we were going to have a music, a suspense music, but we couldn't <laughs> find a suitable one, is Micro City uh, for IELU. I'd like to thank Orhan Oja for contribution. Okay, and the winner is, <laughs> of course, the Nano Prince. We would like to invite Andrei Rogac, Professor Rogac, for presenting the prize <laughs> over there. <laughs> not, not to me, but. <laughs> Now the posters, um, it was very tough selection and uh, the first runner up is Tolga Tarkan Ölmez. Okay. Any co-authors? Esra? At all. <laughs> okay, Professor Meyer, please. <laughs> okay. The next runner-up is Gökhan Günay. Uh, sorry. Who, 
liquid. Okay. okay. Okay, Professor Heinz, please. Okay, one more run. So uh, the winner is Ranjit. Is he here? Okay, I'll, I'll take the prize for him. Yes, you will take it. Well, uh, Anita, is she here? Anita, no? No. Okay. We can close the projection. Uh, projection is under the lens. Capable lens. I would like to invite uh, our invited speakers again for a photo together. Yes. And and Orhan Ajam, please. Again. So who is bigger? <laughs> Okay, thank you all. So, uh, those who couldn't take photo, they can take photo in the <laughs> booth called Nano Man. It exists, really. You can. S Where is it? Uh, in the ground floor. So, in front of the clean room. Okay, uh, and then we have open house, uh, as I mentioned before. You can still register for it. And with that, we, uh, I would like to invite again Professor Hilmi Volkan Demir, our director, for closing remarks. Well, I think this brings us to the very end of our program, right before the open house. But I believe uh, we enjoyed ourselves very much, thanks to the wonderful lectures delivered by our distinguished, invited uh, keynote speakers, and of course, with the presence of yourselves. So hopefully, uh, next year, uh, we will be all together again, which I believe is a great celebration of continuing success of UNA. Thank you very much, all, and see you around.
Tamam canım. Görüşürüz. Aynı mı? Tamam. Sen direkt bölüme gidiyorsun. Thank you.